Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started today because today's speaker is an absolutely exciting speaker for me to present. Um, I am so happy that she is here with us today. Um, and so I'll get started on that in just a second. For those of you who are new to our Cyber Conversations, we want to welcome you and thank you for finding us and logging in. CyberHer is a program out of Dakota State University in Madison, South Dakota, and we cannot be happier to have you joining us today. So you can find more information about CyberHer on our website at www.cyberher.org. I am Katie Shuck, and I've got along with me Kanthi Narukonda, who we um, are some of the leaders there at CyberHer. We also have our founders, Dr. Pam Rowland, joining us. And I'm not going to introduce our other founder yet because you'll hear about her in a second. Um, I do want to remind you that if you have questions that you would like to ask during the presentation, you can ask them via the Q&A that you will find at the bottom of your screen. So just ask any questions. You can ask them at any point during the, the conversation today. And Kanthi will be facilitating that Q&A later on. But without further ado, I am so excited to introduce you to, I call her the queen of awesome, um, but she is Dr. <laughs> Ashley Podorodsky. She is the Associate Dean of the Beacom College of Computer and Cyber Science at Dakota State University. Um, she is also one of the co-founders of CyberHer. She is a digital forensic expert, um, and you'll want to ask about her history with the Xbox as well. Um, she is a leading woman in cybersecurity. I, I cannot say enough about her and I'm thrilled to have her on here speaking. She is a personal friend of mine and I know she would love to be your friend as well. So Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand the conversation over to you. Well, thank you, Katie, for the fantastic introduction and Kanthi for all of the work that you guys are doing to lead these initiatives for CyberHer. You guys have made a, a huge impact um, during this time of uh, uncertainty with in-person events. So thank you guys for everything you're doing. And I just noticed my dog is making appearance as well. So there's Stella. <laughs> Um, as Katie said, my name is Ashley Podorodsky, and I um, want to start talk about how I got into the field of cybersecurity. So I'm going to go back more than 20 years ago to high school. So like a lot of you on this call today, uh, you're wondering what you're going to do with your life, where you fit in. And in high school, I fit in everywhere and kind of nowhere at the same time. I, I was captain of the basketball team and pitcher of our championship softball team. Um, I played the trumpet in band, but I was also the president of the computer club. When you grow up in a small town, you do everything because if you don't, there's not enough people to have a team for anything. And so you just have to dabble in everything. And I took any class that I could in computing and math, and I wanted to learn as much as I, I could in that area. After high school, I went to Dakota State University. So I enrolled um, and I was studying e-commerce and computer security. And I was often the only woman in the classroom and I was often the only woman um, were most places that I went. Um, I was the first woman and only woman that worked at the help desk repairing computers and troubleshooting the network. So in 2005, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in computer security, and then I went to work. I, I thought I would work in industry for most of my life, and um, I was a network admin and security admin. And one day at work, something happened that totally changed the path of my life. Someone had modified some files on a server, and we had to figure out who it was and what they did. And at that point, um, you know, as a security admin, I understand, I understood how data came across our network, how users access different things, what type of utilities would have the logs I needed. And so I started putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And I was looking at user accounts and access logs and the firewall. And I was looking at modified times and date timestamps. And eventually, 
I figured out <clears throat> what user account modified the file in question. And from that point on, I was totally hooked on the field of digital forensics because I could start to see how all these different things held a different piece of the puzzle. And you had to understand them all to bring them together to understand what events transpired. And so after that, I went back and I got my master's degree and then I eventually got my, my doctoral degree. Um, and one thing that was very cool then that's still cool now is that I was the first woman to get my doctoral degree from DSU. And I did that while working um, full time as well. So I was working and getting my degree um, and I loved that. <clears throat> so I earned my degree. And then from there, um, I decided to look beyond South Dakota. Like a lot of people do that grow up in a small town, you think, what if I just did a 180 and had a completely different life from what I knew? And so I started applying to universities all across the country. And fortunately, my degree from DSU opened very, <laughs> a lot of doors. Every place I applied, I had an offer. And so I had uh, my pick of institutions that I wanted to join. And so then I eventually settled on Drexel University in Philadelphia. And I joined um, the Computer Security and Technology Group and I loved it. I had a ton of fun. Um, I lived in a city of millions of people, just completely different than growing up in a small town. I was at a research one institution that was able to start and dig into research. Um, I started my, my work on the Xbox Gaming Council there. So I started to look at, you know, I understood computer forensics well. I understood what kind of artifacts we could get off of systems, how we can tell the story. But I didn't know a whole lot about non-traditional devices. And I grew up on a Nintendo. And a Nintendo where you have, you know, Super Mario 3, because that's the greatest game ever. And... Last week, our, our, our conversation, um, we talked about video gaming, but um, so I grew up playing the Nintendo and, and other games. And I thought, well, you know, we can, we do more than a rudimentary standalone device. It's now a communication hub. And so what kind of digital artifacts exist on that device? Because when you can do different things, people tend to do some illegal things at times that have to be investigated. So I started to write seminal work on how to investigate the Xbox 360 Gaming Council. I was able to help with drug cases, a murder case, and some other things. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, during the time that I was at Drexel, and then also fast forwarding a little bit, I came back to Dakota State. And I was super excited to come back. Um, you know, I loved the city, I loved the energy. But I knew that I grew up with a very student-focused environment, and I wanted to create a very student-focused environment. And at a research one institution, you don't always have that option. It's mostly research. So um, I had a really great offer to come back to Dakota State. My husband had a great offer at his company, and so we took them both, and we moved back to South Dakota. Um, during that time, I was doing private forensic cases for businesses and individuals, um, civil criminal cases, organizations, where they would have something that happened and they had to be investigated. And so I have done, <clears throat> I've, I've done dozens of big professional cases for entities all across the country. So if they had hackers come in and steal data, investigating what happened and figuring out how it, it occurred so that way they can stop it and hopefully prosecute the bad guys. Um, so I did that. Um, a couple years ago, I actually stopped doing professional cases. Um, at DSU, we founded the uh, Dig Force Lab, which is Digital Forensics for Cyber Enforcement. And in that lab, we investigate cases for law enforcement. So instead of doing any professional cases, now it's all for law enforcement. And um, we do all non-child endangerment cases at the lab. Um, Katie is part of that here at DSU. So we take a look at, we, there was uh, two arson cases in our lab, an attempted murder case, and that's just this week. So lots of different drug cases as well. So we look at the devices that people are using in those situations and we investigate them and identify the data that resides on them 
and report that to law enforcement. And it's just a fascinating field because we can take our skill set and we can apply it towards um, the law enforcement community and help them put, um, you know, help them put away people that are doing things that are not making our community safe. So being able to help in that context. Um, I have been doing that for um, two years now and I love it because we get to do a lot of things to help uh, law enforcement, we get to help people um, investigate cases, and it's incredibly exciting. So um, the things that I'm doing at DSU are <laughs> and unpredictable, because here, my five, my four-year-old just got off the school bus and came and said, boo, all right, go find daddy downstairs. <laughs> you just never know what you're going to come across in this, in this area. I love it. Um, so, you know, I started uh, in computer security and I moved towards digital forensics and now looking at emerging devices of data that resides on them and identifying what we can get from it. And so we do, we actually just, we're starting to look at drones right now and the drones are pretty awesome because we can see the GPS coordinates that the drone was going to um, and, and the coordinate of the people that were uh, flying the drone and we can see things in that respect so that's a lot of fun. Mommy. <laughs> Sorry. So okay one more time because now he's a fireman. <laughs> okay I'm on a big call so now you got to go downstairs okay. <laughs> All right so I will turn this over to, to Conte for Q&A. They had a Hudson for me. He is so cute. <laughs> so that is, so I've known you for over five years now, and I never really knew your actual journey to yeah. this point. And it's kind of interesting because you never, I mean, to me, you've always seemed like this awesome person who could do anything. Like, that's the first thing I think of when I think of you. Like, nothing can stop you and oh, you're very I kind love, you. it's it's true like it is really true and that is quite an inspiring journey thank you for sharing that with us yes. we do have a few questions for you already in the q a okay so someone wants to know what the most interesting case you've ever had was or is to this day. Yeah, uh, this one's kind of cool. Um, there was an international hacking gang that had compromised a chain of fast food restaurants here in the States. And they had um, done a few things that resulted in, uh, they're, they're going for credit card data. And so having to figure out how they got in what data that they acquired, so that way they can do some data breach notification. But just one, studying that, that hacking group, um, because they had a name, I don't wanna say it right now, but looking at what they were doing and uh, seeing their calling cards, like what are their indicators of compromise? And um, so that was kind of cool because it was a hacking group that you see all across the country or across the, the national news and taking a look at the the things that they're doing and what they've done and looking at the hallmark of some of their crimes and studying those and then being able to go and see if I can find those same data points um, here on the systems I was looking at. Awesome. So have you had any like really high profile cases, like something everybody would have heard of? Um, yes, but no one would know I was involved, which is really cool. So that, yeah, so that was cool. So, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Hudson, I love it. You got to go find daddy. Okay. Yeah. Go find daddy. Um, so yes. So uh, big cases. Yes. There was a really big case um, where cryptocurrency mining software was embedded in an update that was sent out to a certain industry and it impacted a lot of people a lot of organizations. And so I was involved in that, but um, you know, no one would know I was involved in that. So I assume this question is because they've seen Hudson come up now. Did your kids help motivate you to make a change for young kids in cyber? 
You know what? I love that question because uh, as much as he's interrupting me, it really doesn't bother me because um, absolutely. Um, when I was growing up, my grandpa bought me a make your own radio kit from Radio Shack. And it had the capacitors, the springs, the cables, and I connected it. And that was really cool. I thought, yeah, it's staticky, but I have, I just made a radio. And I remember being in my dad's um, store one day, uh, he had a Napa store and this big giant calculator was on his desk. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna throw it away. It doesn't work anymore. Cause I'm like, why do you have this little one next to the big one? He goes, well, that one, you know, that was my dad's, it doesn't work, but so I have this one. And so I took it apart and I fixed it. I'm like, well, it doesn't work because of this. And so when I was a kid, being able to, to see some of those things hands-on um, was uh, an important foundation for me. But I didn't have, you know, anything near what we have with Cyper. And so I love to be able to create something with, with all of you for, for kids that didn't exist when we were young. So that way kids now can say, they cannot say, I wish that existed for me because it does. And so, yeah, I want to create things for my kids to do. I want my, my seven-year-old daughter, I kicked her out. She's at a friend's house right now. <laughs> they were over here a few minutes ago and being able to, um, you know, show them what the field is and how cool it is and the things that they can do. Because you brought up Cyper, I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you remember the exact moment, like when you thought, you know what would be cool? Like if we, if we had a group to, or an organization to support women in cyber, do you remember the exact moment? I do. And I will always remember this moment. Um, so many times in my life, I've been in a room of all men and someone will will say, rightfully so, where are the women? And I always kind of dance around it. You know, like, oh, well, I don't know what you say. You don't have much to stand on at that point because there's no one else but you. And inadvertently, someone will say, they're just not interested. And I knew that wasn't true. But I, I again, what could I say because there's, I was the only one. And so I remember standing in a classroom for the last time that I heard that. And I thought, you know, I want this to be the last time I hear that because we are interested. There just isn't anything that interests us in what you're doing. And, you know, getting more women in cybersecurity is not a women's issue. It's everyone's issue. We have so many challenging problems to face in this field and we need the best minds to do that. And that's men, or, men and women. And so, you know, it's not women at the expense of men, it's women for the advancement of women. I mean, it's simply that. So yes, the time that I knew I wanted to do something was probably the fifth time that I heard someone say, girls just aren't interested. And I was standing in a classroom and I thought, yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. And I'm gonna do a lot of work to make sure you know that because we are interested. And we thank you for that because Cyber is wonderful. Who would have thought that an organization that started small would now today impact so many young girls and into coming into cyber? So Cyber is just wonderful. Well, thank you. I agree. You know, Pam, uh, Pam and I started it with an idea seven years ago and we got it to the point where we can bring on people like you guys, you and Katie, to, to help advance us. You know, we feel like we got it here and you guys can take it here and all the other students that we're hiring can take it here. And so we, we just love how it's just purely for the advancement of women and support of women. But, you know, we, meet, we need male allies as well. It's not just women for women, it's men and women for, for women. True. So then when you decided to start Cyber, did you face any difficulties from your other peers, particularly male peers? Yeah, absolutely. I think there was some people that just kind of patted me on the back and were like, yeah, 
That that looks cute. That looks fun. You're gonna go do that. Go go do the stuff for girls. You know, pink I it. You love that. Yeah, pink it and shrink it. Just go go play in that little area, and um, but you know, I've never been one for for active like confrontation like that. I just thought, well, um, we're we're gonna create something, and you're gonna see that there's a demand, and from there, it's gonna better all of us. And so, yeah, there was times, there was a lot of times along the way that it's like, gosh, okay, you got to remind yourself that every little hill or mountain that's in front of you, that there's a reason you're overcoming it. And when you overcome it, you have a path for someone else behind you. And so, you know, we've been, that's kind of been what's, I remind myself when we have some challenges. Throughout your career, you've had a few different roles. You were a researcher, then an assistant professor, an associate professor, and now you're the associate dean. Yes. So what has been the most challenging part of all of these roles? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I think the challenge of any position is your initial position. It's right when you're coming into it, right when you're new, because I think we all think we have to um we have to solve world hunger on day one we think we have to solve every problem right as it happens and it's that's not the case but um you know so i always think that the hardest part of a job is the first part of the job as you're learning it and getting your your feet underneath you um trying to be creative trying to have different ways to solve problems trying to look at things differently um those yeah that that has been some of the hardest parts so is there anything really stressful about your job now because you hold a few different roles at the moment yeah. is there yeah. anything that's really stressful yeah you know i think um i don't have a lot of stress in my job and i love that i have a lot of enjoyment in my job I think the things, the things that I, that cause me, um, you know, some concern more than others is trying to find new ways to support students, um, trying to find funding to support student research, to advance some of the research I'm working on, trying to get people bought into the things that I'm doing. Um, you know, in, in academia and as a researcher, you spend a lot of time doing that. You have cool things you want to do, but you have to convince other people that these are worth investing in because it takes money for to do the research that we're doing. And the university doesn't give you that. You have to write grants and apply at agencies and organizations to get money to do it. And so I feel like I'm constantly selling um, my ideas in that respect, but I love it because we get to do some really innovative things. We are right now. I um, my research teams collectively have had over six million dollars in funding and that's a cool milestone um, but we have some private contracts that people can't ever really know about but we're doing some really innovative dark web searches and investigative work and it's super interesting because we get to take a look at a, a problem and see how the dark web is contributing to that problem and what we could do to potentially solve that problem. So, um, you know, being able to work on research projects that no one will ever know about is, is exciting to me because we get to see and look at unique ways to solve problems. What has been the most exciting part of your career until now? You know, um, that's a good question. I think one of the things that's been, you know, the most exciting have been some of the cases, um, you know, working, doing some cases down at the FBI in the Omaha field office and others, you know, that's, that's super exciting. Um, working on some of my research projects that I can't really talk about is, you know, it's exciting to me. Um, but you know, what I find a lot of enjoyment now is finding ways to support people. So finding ways to, help our PhD students like yourself get through their program, um, finding ways to support our new faculty as they come in to help them be successful. So, 
you know, right now, what I find a lot of enjoyment in my career is, is helping advance our PhD students and helping advance our new faculty. What makes all of this worth it? If you had to choose like one moment, where was that one moment where you were grateful for all your work until now? You know, I think it's, it's looking at when people's, um, when people's perceptions change a little bit, when they just, when they don't assume that the professor's a man, when they don't assume that Dr. Podorotsky's a man, when they, when little girls think, hey, you know, of course I can, I can be a cybersecurity expert, you know, of course, why not? I mean, I'd be great at that. <laughs> you know, when little girls think that, yeah, I'm going to pursue a career in this. To me, that's what makes all this awesome because you know, I love doing my research and I love advancing others, but you know, that's looking forward, but looking back, bringing up a path for, for, for little girls to think that, you know, this is a possi possibility for me. Um, you know, instead of, you know, a lot of little girls want to be teachers or nurses or things that they see, but you know, the more that they see cybersecurity and computer science for them to think that, hey, I could do that too. You know, teachers and nurses are extremely important and we need them, but we also need cyber professionals and how, having them realize that they can do that too, to me is, is super cool. So what advice do you have for someone, a, it could be any age, who wanted to get involved with computers, but they don't know where to start? Yes. Um, if they want to get involved, but they don't know where to start, I would say go to our website, cyber.org. We have so many resources out there for, for, for kids. Um, I'd like to say that we've curated select content. Um, we've gone through different resources and we've categorized it. So are you a middle schooler looking for coding? Or are you a high schooler looking for cyber? Because we've categorized all the resources that we've curated. So I would go out there um, and take a look at what we have and, and see what, what pikes your interest. So um, you were at Drexel, big city. Mm -hmm. Then what really drew you back to South Dakota? As a state that seems um, in the middle of the country, what was special about it? Yes, absolutely. And that's a great question. You know, I grew up in South Dakota, so I had a lot of family here. Um, my husband and I, we had been married, um, gosh, we'd been married maybe like eight or nine years at that point. We didn't have any kids, but we wanted kids. And so we wanted to have a family where we could have grandparents around, um, that they could have cousins to play with. And, and so, and we, you know, we both loved growing up in South Dakota. We travel, although not recently, <laughs> but we travel all the time. And so we get to go to... We get to go and see great things all across the country and world, um, but we get to come home where we live in a, a beautiful area on a lake and um, we have great people around us. So, you know, for us, that was easy. What was the best decision that you made that helped you to be where you are today? The best decision is never giving up. You know, I've had some challenges in my career. I've had some challenges for different points, some big ones, and um, keeping a, a calm mind and not giving up is the best thing that I've done. Can you tell us about how you um, came about to, or came about bringing Gen Cyber to DSU? Yeah, um, we had a pilot camp um, the first year of it. So six or seven years ago, 2013, I think it was. We had a pilot camp and um, I was helping teach in that pilot camp. It was a co-ed camp for high school. And there were about 10% women at that camp. And I remember going around from classroom to classroom thinking, seeing the same exact thing. Here are the guys in the front getting their hands dirty, if you will, and the girls are standing to the back because they think, you know, I'm interested in this and I like it, but I also like going out to the lake on the weekends with my friends. You know, I'm not going to land parties. I'm not 
spending all my time gaming. I just like it. I just might not love it. And so they get some imposter syndrome, like maybe I just don't belong. And so I thought, why don't we create something where they can't stand to the back or they have to be in front. And so I, I quietly advocated the national security agency to do it. And I worked for months to get this funded and we called it a pilot camp because we didn't know, you know, pilots, we don't know if you're going to be successful. So we're going to throw the word pilot on it. We're just going to try it. And so that first year in January, I found out that we had funding for it. I had a notice that one of the directors at the agency set aside a portion of his budget, his personal budget to fund this camp. And um, I got $70,000, $70,000 for 60 girls. And um, he, he asked me, he said, well, how many girls can you get to the camp? Because I'm looking around and right now you don't have many girls here at all. So why can you have a girls only camp and have numbers? And I said, I can get 60 girls. And inside I thought, ha, you liar. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> but you know, inside I was like, holy crap, now I have to, but on the outside I was calm and apparently, um, I, I, I displayed strength, but uh, inside I thought, hmm, how am I going to do this? Um, and so we opened registration, sent out some emails to schools that we had visited. And within two weeks, I told myself, I'm not going to look at registration because I knew I was going to go in there every minute, refresh, 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 and see hopefully people trickling in. Um, and at that point, we saw there was 180 girls that had registered. We went from 60 to 180 and I thought, holy crap, that's amazing. That's awesome. But then I had a whole new level of panic of, well, how can I do this without them? And so, I mean, how can I hold a camp for 180 if I only have funding for 60? And so I, um, that was my first experience with uh, philanthropy and fundraising. Um, I went to uh, SDN Communications in Sioux Falls and I asked them to bring funds to the table so we can go from 60 to 100 and they did. And so that was a lot of fun as well. So um, yeah, that's how we went down that road. Awesome. So from 60 to 180, three times more. I love that. Um, our final question to you is, what advice do you have for the youth that are watching this session right now? You belong. Your contributions are important and you can have a big impact on our field. That is wonderful advice and I, I so wholeheartedly agree with that. You really can have an impact on our field and um, every girl can. So thank you, Dr. A Ashley, for coming along and starting this program and just helping it be the success that it is. We're really appreciative for it. Now, I am going to launch a poll here for all of our attendees. If you can fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. And you'll want to join us next week as we have another CyperHer conversation coming. You can find out more information on our website at CyperHer.org or follow us on our social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we also will have all of our recordings um, for our CyberHer conversations on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed any or if you know you're going to miss one in the future, you can always go to our YouTube channel and search for CyberHer to find all of the previous recordings as well as a lot of other great and fun videos on cybersecurity. So also, if you have not already done so, if you are a sixth to ninth grade girl, please go to our website and sign up for our upcoming virtual camp, the Gen Cyber uh, Camp coming up. It'll begin in mid-November. Registration is still going on for that. It is free and virtual. So we are just excited to still be able to offer this to you. But thank you, Dr. Podorowski, for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who is watching. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Mm -hmm.